Today we are putting the Maz Art Komorebi watercolors to the Western style watercolor field test. I'm going to show you guys how to paint this beautiful cherry blossom girl and we're going to talk about these watercolors in depth. So keep watching. <laughs> penciled my illustration in using color eno lead ahead of time um it is i don't want to say it's watercolor compatible let's just say that it works well with watercolor it's, it's not entirely not water soluble but it definitely works well with watercolors here is the etagame postcard i produced in the last field test video and you guys can click this card here to check that out and in another 15 seconds, you can click the other card to check out my initial unbox and swatch review. But I really like these fairly inexpensive Gansai Tombi style watercolors. And I'm excited to try them out with something a little more how I normally paint. I love doing edigami postcards, but I spend the majority of my time painting in a more Western style. So I have here a selection of brushes, a Daisy Weld palette, and a cup of clean water. The first thing I'm going to want to do with this is I'm going to want to paint a background. And I typically, typically go for, um, can I remove this? No, I can't. I typically go for blue skies for this sort of thing, just because it has a nice kind of relaxing, appealing, soft look to it. Um, I want it to be kind of a cherry blossom scene though. So what I think I might do is I think I might actually save the sky for last and paint her first and then maybe paint the cherry blossoms because I may want to add in some more that I haven't even sketched yet. So I think I'm going to actually start with her skin tone, which is pretty unusual for me. When I do this sort of lineless watercolor painting, I really have to be careful. It tends to get out of hand if you aren't. And it's good to kind of go in with a good idea of what you want to do. And I'm going to start with the red ochre. And rather than, oh man, see that's like a ready-made skin tone right there. I was going to say, rather than mixing in some red, I might just go straight with the red ochre. So Gensei Tombi style paints tend to behave a little bit differently than um, Western watercolors, and they can take some getting used to. And it's been a while since I've used any for this sort of a watercolor piece. Oh yeah, like almost right out of the pan with a little bit of water, it makes for a really good Caucasian sort of basic skin tone. So if you're someone who um, you don't want to have to mix your skin tones or, you know, you, you want a lot of colors because you want a lot of your colors mixed for convenience ahead of time, this is already looking like it's going to be a strong contender for that. And it's really quite an affordable set. Right, so this color dried pretty light. One of the neat things about working with a pre-mixed sort of skin tone color is I can just grab some, mix it in, and I know the proportions are gonna be right. It's not gonna be too red. It's not gonna be too yellow. So it actually makes it very easy for me to just add a dollop in and mix with confidence. So let's say you do convention watercolors, which, <laughs> I've given that a try and I think it's a little bit crazy, but only because the customers come back every five minutes to ask about their commissions. But let's say that's you and you don't mind doing it. And uh, you're looking for a watercolor set that's affordable just in case you lose it or forget it. Um, and has a lot of good pre-mixed colors that you're actually going to use. Something that has a good skin tone already mixed or looking at this set multiple working skin tones already mixed can really help facilitate your painting and help cut down on that time because mixing paints takes space and requires precision. And it also takes up time to color match. So being able to work directly from pans of convenience colors can be really helpful. So there are a lot of really bright neons in this set. And for this piece, I don't want to use the neons or the metallics. I may have to come back and do another field test where I do those, but they are just too intense. There are a few pre-mixed pinks 
in the set, but none exactly what I'm looking for. So I'm gonna mix up a pink using Carmine and Cerise. And if you're wondering what these colors look like, you can check out my initial unboxing swatch. And I'm using this because I want to at least start filling in the cherry blossoms and sort of get an idea of how much space they're taking up and how much pink they're adding to the page so I can decide if I want to paint in some more. So that pink is actually gonna be a really good pink for this. And I want to go ahead and sketch in a few more flowers just very lightly here and there. And I'm just sort of freehanding them. So now that we've sketched in the cherry blossoms, and they look, real, I really like how they look, I kind of want to start to paint in the sky. And I probably will not do the greatest job of that, unfortunately, just because <laughs> it's going to be hard to, to paint around all these fine forms without ruining them. And I want a very little bit of ultramarine blue. Maybe I want to go like full ultramarine blue and that would make the cherry blossoms look really delicate then. So I'm just picking it up directly from the pan and I'm mixing it in one of my wells. I am doing this just because I want color consistency and I've had, I've had a lot of trouble painting with ultramarine blues. They tend to sediment out. This one is not quite as dark as I would like. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna paint my first coat and then go back in and tighten it up. And I'm trying to be really delicate. It's okay to leave a white edge sometimes cause that kind of gives it this like bouncy light refraction kind of appeal but you don't want it to look like it was copy and pasted in or like it was a second thought. Even when you do things that are a second thought, you always want it to try and look at least like you're happy it's there. I'm actually gonna leave a little bit of a halo around here. I wish I'd left one around the head. I've seen that done by some of my favorite Magica when they do their spot color illustrations and it really looks beautiful. It really makes it look sun-kissed and kind of ethereal. So it's a technique I would love to play around with. And I'm kind of saving my lighter areas for later. Not my lighter, my like island areas for later. And I'm doing that so that I don't get any harsh edges where say the paint dried and I I'm trying to go in and join the two areas and not doing a very successful job of it. So I save those little islands for later because they can be painted after everything has been kind of joined and it won't look like it was just stitched together. I'm really actually enjoying how these watercolors are handling, especially on this paper. Uh, Fluid 100 is a sort of a low grain watercolor paper. And I don't want to put my hand in the wet. There are two areas in her hair that need to be addressed. All right, I'm gonna give this another pass. I'm gonna mix the color darker, but I want to let this dry first. Oh, it's actually kind of beautiful like that, but let's go a little darker, right? It's a small risk. 
And we've actually done a lot of the hard work by kind of determining where we want to place our colors. So I'm going to scoop up and mix in a lot of ultramarine blue. And then I'm going to just do the same thing I did before, where I kind of start in one corner. Oh, yes. That's a much nicer intense blue. And I'll actually start leaving halos here and there. You guys can always tell when I'm enjoying a technique because my voice gets like that little sing-song lilt to it. I think that blue is going to be a good blue. I also enjoy that this is not a super granulating ultramarine. Most of the ultramarines I've used have been very granulating, which isn't a problem. I just have difficulty kind of controlling it. Pick some up that I'd allowed to puddle. But so far, these paints are very easy to work with. I like them for the edigami field test. And I like them now. When you see 40 colors for $25, you definitely have some misgivings and concerns. We haven't gotten too far in either. And I'm just kind of going up into the flowers and adding some irregular bits of blue just to kind of break up some of the pink shapes. Also, I just love the combination of the pink I've mixed here and the stock ultramarine blue. It's a really nice combination. Give that petal a little more definition by kind of outlining it a little bit. Soak up that area. It's going to end up being a little bit darker. I never really try to go for flat washes when it comes to ultramarine. That's going to be, or at least so far, it's really pretty. All right, so the sky is still very cool to the touch. I can probably get away with working on non-adjacent areas. Oh, I really want to work on the um, cherry blossoms, though. They're really pretty. So I either need to show restraint or um, just work in a different area. What I can do is use a little bitty bit of that ultramarine, and I maybe should switch to a finer brush. Do the tops and then do the inside of her mouth. And give that all a chance to dry, I think. Although, kind of want to actually lift out some of her eye using a little bit of paper towel. Yeah, like that. Oh, yeah. All right. And then I'll just let the rest of it dry. All right, guys, this has had plenty of time to dry. I'm going to grab a little more Carmine and Cerise so we can get that nice hot pink color. And I'm going to start on the defined cherry blossoms. And then sort of work my way out. And to help keep this from being too modeled, I'm gonna throw some of the larger shapes into shadow, kinda help maybe pull some definition. And then I'll go ahead and do another layer on her skin tone of the very watered down red ochre.
So I'm gonna use a little bit of crimson, very much watered down for the lips and the cheeks. It's a little bit browner than I expected it would be. I wonder if some blue from my palette had gotten mixed in. Let's try again. I'm also going to go in with the ultramarine blue and just sort of selectively darken certain areas. And then while I give that a chance to dry, I'm gonna think about what color I wanna make her hair and her clothing. So um, the crimson has had a chance to dry and it's really desaturated for a crimson. It's kind of like a blood red. Um, as opposed to like a nice intense blood red, it's just kind of like a, a muted blood wet red. I may be working a little too desaturated for it to really shine. And I didn't really want it to look like a punch in the face or anything intense like that. I just thought that I would be able to pick up some, some actual color there. So I'm gonna give her brown eyes, because I don't really do that very often. And I'm gonna start with yellow ochre. I think I'll give her similarly colored honey blonde hair, so I'll use yellow ochre for that as well. And I'm gonna have room to sort of build up shade, so I'll water it down at first. All right, that's pretty nice. Give that a chance to dry and then I'll do another layer. While that dries, I'm gonna go into Carmine and Cerise, pretty saturated. So I'm only gonna grab a little bit of water to help mix the colors and make sure I have enough to consistently go around. I'm gonna do the insides of my cherry blossoms, and I am looking at reference. I find it just makes it easier for me to do my job well. I'm gonna use this slightly more saturated mixture to just help me define some of these forms a little bit better. Add a little bit of contrast. There's some colors in this set that seem to work really, really well. And then some, like the crimson, which are just very muted and kind of strange. I would be interested in doing a light fast test on this palette since I'm not really sure how they're deriving their colors. This Kamurebi set is certainly an interesting watercolor palette. It's a little bit big to be a good field sketching palette, but it's got a lot of colors. And they're pre-mixed. But then it's also got like those neons, which are gonna be dye-based. So even if the set says it uses Pigments, you can't do that with neons. Neons are, are dye based. And then you have the metallics, which probably contain mica powder. That's usually the go-to favorite for pearlescence and metallics. Of course, this paper, no fluid 100 paper, I really enjoy painting on fluid 100. Might even just switch over and do some of this pink on her cheeks and on her lips because that crimson is so disappointing and this pink is a really, really nice pink. I thought it would be a little bit warm. Well, a little intense or kind of a natural colored person. Right. 
Then let's sneak in here and try it on our cheeks. Looks pretty intense right now. Hopefully it'll dry a little less intense. That looks really nice on the Sakura. So I'll give all that a chance to dry and then I'll get back to working on her hair. All right, yeah, that pink is a little stronger than I wanted, but rather than mess with it too much, I'm just gonna move on and work on doing some yellow ochre in her hair. Doing hair like this, it's really helpful to have a decent brush that can still pull a good point or a new brush. I'm using a Utrecht Kalinsky Red Sable, which I think is just squirrel with some synthetic in it, but it's good. It holds a good point. And I bought it years ago, like when I lived in Savannah. So it's seen many years of rough treatment and it's still holds up pretty decently. If it is indeed synthetic, it's one of the best synthetics I've ever used. Coma Rebbe's yellow ochre, yellow ochre, when watered down, has a really nice kind of honey gold color. When it's a little thick, like it is here, it sort of loses some of that beautiful translucent quality. You know that is because it is an opaque color, but it's funny how quickly it loses that beautiful quality of catching the light. So I am trying to decide what color I want to go with for her dress. And I'm just really, really stumped. I kind of want to go with something neutral because the pinks are so pretty and the blue is so pretty. But I feel like that's a little bit of a cop out. I tend to go for neutrals pretty often. I like neutrals myself. Um, and I also want to use, for the most part, color straight from the palette or very close uh, to give you guys kind of an idea. And this palette has 40 different colors in it. And even if we're not doing neons and metallics, there's still a lot of colors that I'm just not going to be able to get to. Oh, so I'm at a bit of a dilemma. I guess I'm going to try using Burnt Sienna as sort of a base. Hmm, really don't like that. I know I want her bow and her, her uh, tassels to match. And I think Carmine might be the color I want for that. And you can just lift these pans out. They're the size of uh, full-size watercolor pans and they're filled pretty full. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Gansai Tombi paints, you know you get those big pans, but they're not filled quite all the way up. And you also use up a lot of paint, usually, with Gansai Tombi paints when you're painting. Because uh, at Agami painting, you paint very thickly. I feel like the uh, Mozart Komorebi watercolors are already lending themselves quite well to Western style watercolor. They might take a little bit of getting used to, but I'm not having any significant tr troubles with them other than, you know, the red on the cheeks, which is a pretty minor problem. And uh, the colors are also very easy to work with and very brilliant, even if you've watered them down a bit. And that was something that I didn't really like about the um, Kuratake Genzai Tambi paints is that once you water them down, they lost a lot of their vibrance. Although these Como Rebis are kind of making me want to revisit my Ganzai Tambi with a slightly different approach. That's the interesting thing about reviewing watercolors over a span of multiple years is your style change, your ability changes and how you handle things can change and develop. So what was a problem three years ago is not necessarily a problem now because I've 
<laughs> I've painted with Crayola, so kind of feel like I'm prepared for anything. But the colors in this set so far, really nice, brilliant. We'll see, I guess, if this color will bleed a little bit once I paint adjacent to it. See, I don't want to take away from the cherry blossoms, I still want them to be an important feature. But I don't want her to not look pretty and fresh like the flowers. I want her to be just as pretty as them. Just gonna go into the flowers with Cerise, Carmine, not Cerise. A little bit of Carmine and just add a few details here. And all, although most of these, well, actually, most of these colors do have like official sort of um, common sense watercolor names like yellow ochre or red ochre or violet or olive green, like things we kind of can see in our heads. It, it's not like, you know, bubblegum toodaloo or whatever. Um, there are some colors that are some sort of like cerise, for example, or hyacinth violet or grass green, you know, they're descriptive without being color names that evoke a specific color to most artists, but um, they're fairly spot on. I do think grass green, which is, oh, it's a good green. It's a little uh, more muted than I personally think of when I think of grass green, but it's still not a bad color at all. And uh, still fairly grassy and green. So I at least know what I want to do for her underdress. I am going to grab some of that ultramarine blue and basically paint it white by watering it down and then only painting in the shadow that you dry, if you're dry. We're going to find out in a minute if these will bleed into each other. So for now, I only have a clear direction on the underdress. And it's because I kind of want to keep the light, fluffy feeling of the cherry blossoms going on with her clothing. So that first layer has had a chance to dry. I'm going to go ahead and just sort of tighten up some of the shadows a bit so it actually looks like shadow. That's the goal, right? So to do that, I'm mostly just doing some cast shadow here and there. And I still haven't decided on a color for her main dress. I'm probably going to go with a lighter shade of carmine, which doesn't make me happy. I want to do something a little more, um, something that's going to kind of pop. So maybe I should go with a green, but I feel like that's a little too contrasty. So I'm still trying to decide on what color to make the main part of her dress. All right, I think, oh, I say that and then I'm like, all right, second thoughts. I was sort of thinking about going with their burnt sienna, but watered down and then doing a surface design on the dress. I think a surface design would honestly be the cutest. You know what? I'll just, just be a chicken and actually use the same pink I used on the flowers, because I've been thinking about doing that anyway, and then maybe doing like a surface pattern to kinda, I don't know. Either she'll just blend in completely, camouflage, or it'll look good. And there are so many colors in this palette that I just never really, or I haven't really given myself a chance to use, so. This is a small selection. So I think what I'm gonna do with this is I'm going to apply maybe a couple of layers to her overdress and then let everything kind of dry overnight and then come back to it. Maybe tighten up my details a bit. And so far I haven't really had too many problems with like color migration or bleeding They've been pretty stable. 
at least as stable as any other watercolors I've used. Maybe a little more so than some, and certainly not bleedy the way they would be if they were dye based. It'll be fun to do something specifically with the neons and see how stable they are, the feeling they won't be just because they're neon and to get neons, you have to use dyes. All right, there is our base color and she definitely looks blendy and with the background. Maybe I should go a lot darker with the color and then do a surface design on that. So I'm gonna go ahead and mix some Cerise and some Carmine and get back to you guys. While that finishes drying, I'm gonna go ahead and do some of the tighter details on the underdress. And I'm basically using the same ultramarine that I ended up mixing for the final sky color. All right, let's put on another layer of pink. I don't want to lose the pop that those ribbons have, but I also don't want her to get quite so lost among the blossoms. Man, these two together are just super duper nice. And I'm still gonna leave some highlights. I've been trying to keep my watercolor a little bit more bouncy and vibrant. I think I like that a little bit better. All right, so I'm gonna do another layer of this hot pink, and then I'm gonna call it a night. Give everything a chance to fully dry, and give my paints a chance to evaporate a little bit so that I can have access to darker tones. It hasn't been difficult to mix the colors that I want with this set, but you know, it's bedtime. I apologize, I know I keep hitting the camera. I'm using an actual extra long paintbrush just because I actually really like the brush on it. And I've thought about cutting it down before, but I'm worried that's gonna affect the balance and how well it handles. I think tomorrow I'll finish up what's left to do of sort of the basic color fills. I don't even know if there's anything left to do, but if there is, I'll finish it tomorrow. And then I'm going to do a little bit of shading. I don't want to do too much because I tend to be really heavy handed and I want this piece to look really light in spring. But I also want to see how these colors handle for shading and uh, just whatever else needs to be finished up. I will do that tomorrow. Hey guys, so it is a brand new day and the water is clean and the watercolors are dry. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna put another layer of carmine down on her tassels and on her bow. And then once that has dried, we can work on her dress a little bit more, just kind of doing some of the final details. I'm gonna use a finer finer brush just to tighten some of those details up and add a few shadows. Now that that has had a chance to dry, I'm gonna go in with my slightly evaporated mixed hot pink, mix it up again. And add a few shadows here and there. I know I talked about um, doing like skin shadows, etc. today. 
So that's on the docket. And then as that dries, I can get back to work on finishing her hair. I don't want to do too many layers in her hair though, since uh, cheaper watercolors tend to be prone to reactivation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and mix up the color I want to use to shade her skin. And I'm kind of thinking hyacinth violet with maybe a little cerise in it. We'll see. Because it's supposed to be a bright day. So we don't want to overshadow things, but having some kind of vivid shadows might be nice. And then maybe even a little bit of violet. I think this would be a really fun set to do some loud, fun floral watercolors with. I mean, it's just kind of a good all rounder. There, that's a good color. So we'll let everything dry and then we'll come in with that. So it's time to finally do some shadow on the skin. I wanna keep it really light handed. I know I have a real tendency. Oh yeah, that's gonna look really pretty actually. Might even be too light, I say, the heavy handed one. The problem if it's too light is that it ends up just looking kind of muddy. But if it's too dark, it definitely ends up looking kind of muddy. So it's all about finding a balanced saturation. We'll do this and then we'll let it dry and we'll go from there. I don't know if you guys know this. I don't, um, I don't have an Etsy. I don't sell my art online because I create so much of it, but I do sell it at conventions. So if you see me at a con and there was a piece you really liked, you can probably get it from me there. I also am willing to sell it through email. I just don't feel like keeping up with an Etsy. I used to do that in high school and in undergrad because I sold Kanzashi. That's just not, didn't really work the way I wanted it to work. For me, like constantly restocking with uh, one of a kind items and I was producing several a week. It was just a lot to juggle. And I'm in kind of the same position where I'm creating a lot of original art, mixing it just a little bit darker. And then once this dries, I'll go ahead and do a second layer of this uh, shadow skin tone, skin tone shadow. Let's go in for round two, electric boogaloo. Hopefully this will be dark enough. It's a really pretty color. And I'm really pleased. I know this piece is kind of simple, but I'm really pleased with how it's turning out. And I am enjoying these watercolors. Every now and then I get to review an inexpensive set and I'm like, these are actually really great. And I didn't see that coming with these Mozart watercolors. But they did. Okay. So I'm going to let that dry and probably do some further details in her hair. And then I need to decide on what I want the surface design for her dress to be. Since I've done the shading on her skin, I'm going to use a really fine brush to do the inside of her mouth. And I am not even going to play around with crimson. That's the only color so far I haven't liked, but I really didn't care for it. You know? Carefully fill in the inside of her mouth. I think that's going to be a good color on top of yellow ochre too. So mix some red ochre and some yellow ochre together. And we're going to get started kind of tightening up the details in our hair. And I think I'm going to go in with some burnt sienna. So 
So when it comes to doing surface patterns, I found that I have the best results when I go ahead and I do the surface pattern. Well, I do the shadow first and then I do the surface pattern. The reason tends to be because um, surface patterns are painted a little more thicker. They're, in my mind, they're considered a design for the most part. So um, you go ahead and you do your shadow for that. And I think what I'm gonna do for this is I'm gonna use violet to do the shadow color for the dress. And I'm trying to do really light shading just so that it doesn't become too overwhelming. I'll have to see how this dries, but I don't think it's gonna be quite dark enough. I have to go a little dark. Oh, to go a little bit darker with it. That makes kind of a good base color. And it doesn't neutralize the pinks I've used so much that it no longer reads as pink. This actually works quite nice. And I think I might even use this to shade some of the flowers as well. So I'll give this a chance to dry and then I'll do that. So the dress is dried. It looks like it could be a little darker, but I'm going to go ahead and use the purple that I've already mixed to lightly, always the key word here, lightly paint some shadows in on the background cherry blossoms. Just use it to help create a little bit of depth because right now everything's kind of at the same level. Ooh, I got a little bit of lift up there in this flower. But honestly, it's the first lift up, lift up I've gotten. And I am glazing over kind of thicker painted details, which is something I normally wouldn't do. I normally would do the glazing before I got to any of that. So I'm kind of impressed that it held up as well as it did. So I'm gonna grab some more violet. And let these flowers dry so I can get back to work on the dress. Now that that's dried, I'm gonna go in again with the purple. And hopefully build in a little bit of tighter shadows. Now, all this layering is when less expensive, cheaper watercolors tend to start falling apart. It's also when I started having problems with the Kuretake Gansai Tombi set when I did a little research and I realized that those kind of watercolors aren't even designed for the sort of painting I'm doing or that I typically enjoy doing. So the reason I'm putting these through that test is some people really like using Genzai Tombi style watercolors. You get a lot of watercolor in the pan. They're fairly inexpensive. So a lot of people enjoy using them. And I feel like up until this point, these watercolors have really performed well and they really haven't done anything super disappointing yet. Um, I can just kind of tell they're not gonna give me much more, which is fine. That's actually why I opted to use a cotton rag paper. Cotton rag papers tend to be able to take a few more layers than cellulose based papers. So I thought if I was gonna get the best results out of these paints, it would be on a cotton rag paper. And then I'm just gonna go into the background flower just a little bit, not enough to really make a huge difference. Just knock a little bit more shadow in here and there. And this out a little bit. Okay, so we're making really good progress. I'm really pleased with where we are. I'm actually going 
to continue my trend of overworking things and add just a little bit, hopefully just a little bit, of purple to kind of shade her hair a little. Add a wee bit of contrasty depth. And I'm going to let this dry. My next challenge is to use some violet on these tassels to add a little bit of shadow. The tassels and the rim. I'm gonna start on the tassels because if I screw up, that's easier to hide. Just trying to get the excess paint off my brush. And that definitely seems a little dark. Watercolor tends to dry lighter than it goes down. So I'm kind of hoping as it dries, it'll lighten up a bit but that might not happen. I might have to do an overlayer. Move on to adding some shadow to the ribbon. So far, this is working out much better. Looks good in the preview, at least. Now I need to decide what sort of surface pattern I want to do for her dress. And I kind of want to do something in white. So I'm going to start by trying the Como Revy White out and put some water on it. Oh, speaking of, before doing this test, I didn't pre-activate any of these pans. I normally do that. I didn't with these. Um, they have a not enough binder. It's sort of like glycerin, but it's not really. It's um, a type of glue, I think. But they have enough binder where they activate really quickly. I don't need to let water sit on them. If I let water sit on them, they'll turn gummy really fast. So that is a big difference between Genze Tombi style watercolors where you don't need to pre-activate them and traditional Western watercolors where if they're dried, you do need to give them a little bit of time to kind of soak up some water. Okay, so the pink has had a chance. Everything has had a chance to dry, really. Um, I have, ooh, no, that had brown in it. Meow. Get that out and see if you're clean now. Yeah. What sort of design do I want to do on a dress? Isn't that something I should have figured out beforehand? Hmm, if I go too complicated, it'll compete with the flowers in the background. I don't want to do anything floral either. Maybe just dots. And I will usually use um, either Copic Opaque White, White Gouache, or Dr. P.H. Martin's Bleed Proof White to do sort of white detailing. And I probably will grab for that again. But I wanted something a little softer. Unfortunately, it doesn't even seem to be really showing up. And fix that. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, the white is just super unimpressive, and you guys can probably see I'm working with it really thickly. This is pretty typical for watercolor sets that include white. White is usually used as a mixing color to make pastels, which is something I've never really understood because you can make pastels by adding more water. So um, another reason white is often included is to make colors more opaque and that I can understand because it tends to be like titanium white or zinc white or some other white that has like opaque properties to it but I don't really use white to make pastels I just paint the colors lighter grab some more yellow ochre I think I'm gonna let this dry and then I'm gonna start tightening details. So we're almost finished. All right, ah! no. One of the first steps I'm going to take when tightening up this watercolor, because it's lineless, so it means I need to do a little bit of additional work to really pull together and make it look finished. But the first thing I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm going to use the skin tone that I mixed yesterday and I allowed it to evaporate overnight. I'm going to use that to pull in not only some tighter details, but also to do some of the lining for me. I'm also going to use it here and there to darken some of the colors. And it's not quite as dark as I would like Fortunately, 
I was able to get this color by a single, using a single pan. So that actually makes life easier for me because I can just mix more of that in. This is a technique I often use with my little convention watercolors. And they come out really, really cute. So I'm gonna grab some more red ochre over to the side. All right, I could probably go even darker than that in some areas. So working a little bit more directly with red ochre. Whoa, that went too far. Now I have to do it over on this eye so they match. And after that dries, I think I'm gonna line that further with burnt sienna, just so that it's dark enough to actually kind of stand out on her face. work some of the brown into lining her hair. And I actually really like how she's coming out. I wasn't sure because it's a very passive piece. I wasn't sure how I'd feel about it. I'm gonna use Carmine now to start doing the same thing on her dress. I really enjoy using this technique, but it also really benefits from a steady hand, which I don't always have. Very similar to inking for comics. And then maybe just a little bit of that here and there. Should have knocked more of the water off of that. And zoom out a little bit so you guys can see what I'm doing again. And then all that's really left is to do some details with white. And I'm not super impressed with the white they've included. So I am going to use some bleed proof white to go ahead and do my details. There, we're all done. I think she turned out actually very lovely. I'm really happy with how this piece, well, I say all done and then I'm like, oh, there's a thing I could do though. Uh, anyway, I'm really happy with how this piece turned out. I'm really, really happy and pleasantly surprised by how the Como Rebi watercolors handled. They exceeded my expectations, and I think they're even a little bit easier and more flexible to work with than the Kurotake Genzai Tanbi, and I know those are fighting words. Um, and they actually cost a little bit less. No, you don't get the ginormous three-inch, one-third filled pans, but you do get half full pan-sized pans that are full pretty much to the brim. You can do some layering. You can do some shading techniques. You can also use it for edigame if you want. I feel like it's a great price point for artists and crafters who are interested in using watercolor, don't want to spend a lot of money, and they want a lot of colors already mixed. So this could be really good for convention watercolors or even for stampers. Um, you can find this product by checking the description down below. This was purchased out of pocket. And I'd like to thank my patrons, my art nerd community over on Patreon for their generosity. It allows me to be able to afford to do these sort of reviews. So if you guys enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. And I hope to see you guys again really soon with another really cool watercolor review. Bye, guys.